you would think after 10 years that we would have made some progress with this question, but I guess not. Um, and so what that says is prolonged uh, antibiotic yes, therapy Paul. warranted in Lyme disease, question mark. Uh, I have nothing to disclose financially. So I was going to give an overview of Lyme disease. And again, keep in mind that, you know, this is a bunch of Mayo Clinic physicians. Some of them know about Lyme, probably not a lot. Most of them don't. So I was going to go over the scope of the Lyme disease problem, talk about laboratory testing for Lyme disease, persistent infection, pathophysiology of Borrelia infection, and then treatment of Lyme disease with the efficacy of longer treatment and safety concerns, and finally something about co-infections. So Lyme disease has been called the new great imitator. The original great imitator, of course, was syphilis. Um, and that's really been a problem in terms of diagnosis of Lyme disease because a lot of the aspects of Lyme mimic other diseases and other uh, processes. So Lyme disease, as you all know, is caused by Borrelia burgdorferi, which is a spirochete. But this, in fact, is not Borrelia burgdorferi. This is a picture of Treponema pallidum, which is the spirochete that causes syphilis. And it's really hard to tell them apart when you're looking at a slide like this. Lyme disease is transmitted by Ixodes ticks. But for those of you who know about ticks, this is not an Ixodes tick because it has that white dot on it. So this is an amblyoma lone star tick, which carries Lyme disease, but has never been proven to transmit it. So this is another hot topic in Lyme. You know, can these ticks transmit Lyme? Uh, it's still up in the air. The typical classical erythema migrans bullseye rash is a diagnostic of Lyme disease, at least until recently. This is actually a case of ringworm, however, and how would you tell the difference? Well, you ask the patient, does the rash itch? And if they say, yes, it itches like crazy, then it's ringworm. If they say, no, it doesn't itch, my, my, my wife noticed it yesterday while we were in bed, that's a Lyme rash. So that's how you would distinguish it by talking to the patient. And erythema migrans rashes come in different sizes and shapes, and uh, some of them can look like bruises. So that, again, complicates the diagnosis of the disease. Lyme arthritis, big swollen joint, is also classic for the, the, the disease. However, most Lyme patients do not have a big swollen joint. They just have joint pain, much more common with Lyme. This was actually a, an exotic dancer who came to Kaiser with a big swollen knee. And guess what she had? <laughs> she had gonorrhea, gonorrhea, gonococcal arthritis, which is, uh, also causes something that you can't distinguish from Lyme. Now, neurologic complications of Lyme disease are very well known. This is a patient who has Bell's palsy, which is a left facial palsy. Uh, neurologic complications of Lyme are more common with European strains of Borrelia than with the North American strains that we have. And in North America, your average Lyme patient is much more likely to look like <laughs> yes, our former president did have Lyme disease when he was president. He got it on his ranch in Crawford, Texas. He was bitten by a tick, and of course, there's no Lyme disease in Texas. He was treated by an ILADS physician and got all better, but he's never disclosed how he was treated. And it's really unfortunate because he really could have been a spokesperson for Lyme. But there's still a lot of questions that we haven't answered with him. So um, again, classic features of Lyme disease, the tick bite, the EM rash, the arthritis, are really very variably present in these patients. And um, a lot of them don't have these symptoms or these signs. So it's really hard, that makes it really hard to recognize the disease, and that's really responsible for the controversy that we see with Lyme. So what do we know about Lyme? Scope of the problem, there are more than 300,000 new cases of Lyme disease that are diagnosed each year in the US, according to the CDC. Thus, the annual incidence of Lyme disease is six to 10 times higher than HIV AIDS, 20 times higher than hepatitis C virus infection, and 30 times higher than tuberculosis in this country. And it's interesting that the Mayo Clinic people made me change the rate of, of HIV disease because I originally said, said six, but they said, oh, but the rate's going down. So it's really six to 10 now. <laughs> so AIDS is getting less common. Lyme is getting more common. Um, Ixodes ticks carry more than 237 bacterial species and new species of the Lyme spirochetes, such as Borrelia miyamotoi and Borrelia mayoni are being discovered. That's why the Mayo Clinic is interested because they now have a species that's named after them. And so that's one of the reasons why we're having this debate. Oh, that's because I used to, you know, patients, my patients used to go to the Mayo Clinic, you know, because nobody could diagnose them. And they'd come back in tears because, you know, they were told, well, there's no Lyme disease in the US and, you know, you're just tired and go home. 
And, and now they're going, maybe you have Aurelia Mayoni. <laughs> so that's a big, big, uh, a big change. So birds play an integral role in the wide dispersal of Borrelia burgdorferi infected ticks. Rodents such as mice, shrews, squirrels, and chipmunks are the primary reservoir for Borrelia. A deer act as kind of mass transit and bed and breakfasts for infected ticks. They can travel around, they can have sex. It's a great way to get, get, get stuff done. Um, if you're a tick. Um, so culture of viable Borrelia spirochetes in human genital secretion suggests that Lyme disease could be transmitted by intimate contact from person to person. And just as an aside, we finally got a study accepted um, that was submitted three years ago uh, by uh, the journal F1000 Research. So that's now going to be on, Pub, on, on, on PubMed. So you're going to be getting another wave of interest in sexual transmission when that gets out there and everyone starts reading it again after three years. And it hasn't changed, by the way. It's just as relevant now. So turning to laboratory testing for Lyme disease, another very controversial topic. Um, you all are familiar with the CDC algorithm for two-tier testing, which is a screening uh, immune assay or, immuno or, or ELISA test. And if that's positive or equivocal, you do a confirmatory Western blot. So this is wonderful. It's a great, great algorithm. The problem is the CDC approved commercial two-tier Lyme testing done at over four weeks. And that's important. It's not just early disease. It's patients who've been sick for more than a month has a sensitivity of 46%. So it misses more than half of patients with Lyme disease. And to give you some uh, comparison, HIV testing has a sensitivity of 99.68%. So it misses basically nobody with HIV. So the, the specificity of the commercial two-tier testing is about 99%, so there's very few false positives. But in a recent study, it was estimated that in non-endemic areas, uh, the specificity could be as low as 20%. So what that means is that two-tier testing is essentially worthless for most patients with Lyme disease. Uh, and then the high cost of commercial test development and haphazard regulation have hampered improvement in Lyme testing, because if you have something that's approved and making money, why would you change it? And then better testing is already available, but it needs to be accepted by the medical establishment. And to give you some idea of what that better testing looks like, this is a comparison of the CDC uh, Western blot testing versus Igenix Western blot testing. And if you look at the upper right panel, the overall sensitivity of the CDC testing at maximum is 77% if you include IgM testing, which you're not supposed to do if it's a, a more chronic case. If you don't include that, it's about 49%, which is similar to the 46% that I mentioned before. So that's really terrible for a diagnostic test. Now, if you look at the lower right panel, the IgenX testing has a sensitivity of 97%, which is really adequate for diagnosis of Lyme disease for most patients. And then in terms of the specificity, um, if you do a confirmatory test with the Igenix testing, it's about 97, a little more than 97%. So that's also adequate for a diagnostic mm -hmm. test. So Igenix testing, the way it's done now, is really a very adequate system. It's just that nobody likes it. You know, Igenix is the devil. We don't want to have anything to do with them. But if this were accepted and used in, in patients, it would be a much better way to test for Lyme disease. Now, turning to work by IDSA, prominent IDSA people, uh, this is a quote from one of the more prominent scientific journals in the U.S., the New York Times, uh, by Gary Wormser and Ray Datweiler, saying there is no credible scientific evidence for the persistence of symptomatic Borrelia burgdorferi infection after antibiotic treatment. So basically, no chronic Lyme disease. But the, but the weird thing about that is that there is persistent infection in all these animal models, in gerbils, hamsters, mice, dogs, monkeys, and horses. So if there's persistent infection in these animal models, what about humans? Why not, why not in humans? Well, of course, as it turns out, there are numerous examples of persistent infection of Borrelia after antibiotic treatment, adequate antibiotic treatment. And this is a partial list of some of these studies. The one I like is the last one, where Borrelia was cultured from an iris biopsy, from a biopsy of the eye after a patient had been treated. And to show you some more, this is a list from a, an article that Lorraine and I did a few years ago showing all the studies from Europe and, and the US at that time that showed persistent infection after treatment for Lyme disease. And, and infection was demonstrated by culture, PCR, different techniques, uh, histology. 
Um, and so there's lots of evidence that you get persistent infection, chronic infection with this disease. And then this is the most recent, recent variation on that theme. This was a study from uh, John Alcott's group. And what they did was they took a database of 47 million people. This is a good one for the mathematicians. And they found 547,000 patients who could have Lyme disease. And of those, they picked out 52,000 and studied them in more detail. And what they found was that over 63% of these treated Lyme cases had evidence of persistent symptoms, typical of, they call it post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome, but really chronic Lyme disease. So it's not five or 10% of these patients have persistent symptoms, it's almost two thirds of these patients had chronic Lyme disease. Mm -hmm. And so this shows you how, how bad this disease really is. Now, what, but, but maybe these are just patients who don't have a lot of symptoms. Well, this was a study that Lorraine and, and I did a few years ago and looking at the fair or poor health in patients with chronic Lyme disease. And on the right, you can see 16% of the general population says they have fair or poor health. Lyme patients on the left, 72% were reported fair or poor health with chronic Lyme symptoms. So this is not just some nuisance disease. This is a severely debilitating illness, and it's worse than things like congestive heart failure, uh, diabetes, lupus, multiple sclerosis, depression. I mean, it's worse than all of those diseases. And as one patient said from the Under Our Skin film, Lyme disease usually doesn't kill you, it just makes you wish you were dead. Now, how does Borrelia do all this? Um, uh, this is a slide that shows just different mechanisms of stealth pathology, which is what Borrelia does. It sort of gets into different tissues and causes all these symptoms by uh, various mechanisms, which I won't have time to go into. Uh, the tick itself, when it bites you and injects you with its saliva, already sort of sets the stage for this disease because it suppresses the immune system and helps the spirochetes to disseminate. And then the spirochete itself, the Lyme spirochete, has different mechanisms of hiding from the immune system and from antibiotics. It can downregulate its outer surface proteins. It can hide in the extracellular matrix. And it can also cause immune suppression by inhibiting complement, which is a, a one mechanism of, of killing spirochetes. So these contribute to the pathology of Lyme. Also, different shapes and sizes of the Lyme spirochete are factors in this, and this shows, this is a study from uh, Finland that shows different forms of the Borrelia with spiral forms, uh, round bodies, and biofilms. And biofilms have been studied by Ava Shapi's group. Uh, the significance of biofilms is still not exactly clear, but, um, but they may be important for persistence. And then the most recent mechanism is antibiotic tolerant persisters. And again, these are bugs that are not resistant to antibiotics, but they can persist, they can tolerate the antibiotics until the antibiotic treatment is stopped, and then they regrow after that. So that's the latest mechanism of Borrelia persistence. So all of that conspires to make this a nasty bug. <clears throat> all right, so treatment for Lyme disease. Um, again, very controversial topic, as you've seen this week. So uh, Lyme disease treatment issues. The current treatment of Lyme disease features antibiotics that are 50 to 70 years old. Penicillin, tetracyclines, and cephalosporins. These are old drugs, and they don't work very well. And then, as I mentioned, about two-thirds of Lyme cases treated with two to three weeks of these antibiotics will fail those antibiotics and develop symptoms of post-treatment Lyme disease. And then studies of prolonged treatment of post-treatment Lyme disease used 100 days as a maximum, which is inadequate compared to other chronic infections, which usually require anywhere from six months to five years of treatment uh, with antibiotic therapy. And then, as I mentioned, pleomorphic forms, biofilm colonies, and antibiotic-tolerant persisters of the Lyme spirochete make treatment challenging. So this is a, a, a table that shows all of the randomized controlled trials of Lyme treatment that have been done to date. And as you can see, first of all, the total number of patients in these studies is vanishingly small, 646 patients total. That's like nothing. That's a pilot study for most other diseases. So this is really not enough to, you know, to, make any, to draw conclusions about the efficacy of treatment. And the other problem is that if you look at the two studies at Oxy and Berende, where the asterisks are, those treatment studies were not really 
true randomized controlled trials because all the patients got treated. And they all got antibiotics as part of the study. So you can't really qualify this as a randomized controlled trial based on that fact. Um, and just to compare the numbers here, you look at, say, a study of statin treatment. This is a typical uh, meta-analysis of statin treatment. They had 21,000 patients to come up with the fact that statins are really, really effective in treating you know, cardiovascular, preventing cardiovascular disease. And the other issue that's very interesting that Lorraine has, been, has brought up, um, this is a, re a recent uh, article in Nature that showed that of the 10 most commonly prescribed medications uh, in, in the U.S., there will only be one out of five to 23 patients who actually respond to those medications. So even though the general studies, when you look at 21,000 patients, will show they're effective, if you look at subsets of those patients, there are a lot of those patients who do not respond to therapy. So really, subset analysis is very important to determine whether these treatments are, are working or not. And this is something that has not been done in Lyme disease with the very small numbers of patients treated. So does longer antibiotic treatment help in persistent Lyme disease? These are some non-controlled studies that suggest they do. The biggest one was by Sam Danta in 1997, uh, 277 patients. And if you look at the outcome, he found that patients treated for two months with tetracycline had a 33% response rate, but patients treated for three months had a 61% response rate. So that suggests that longer treatment may be effective in Lyme, even with this kind of Mickey Mouse therapy. So what other studies have been done? Well, these are the randomized controlled trials. They all have significant problems. Uh, in the Klempner study, the patients had been sick for an average of almost five years when they were given a 90, another 90 days of treatment. So that's kind of a ridiculous uh, thing to do and think that they would respond to that. Um, the Krupp study actually showed a benefit of treating these patients in terms of fatigue. So that was more of a positive study, but that was kind of shoved under the rug. Study by Dan Cameron, where patients had only been sick for seven months, uh, showed that, that treatment with amoxicillin uh, improved their uh, quality of life. And then the Fallon study, where patients had been sick for an average of nine years, again, failed to show significant improvement after 12 weeks, although there was some improvement initially when they were on treatment, but then they relapsed when pre treatment was stopped. So these are all studies that you know really don't make a lot of sense in some cases. And even in the ones where they do, you can show some benefit if you massage the data. This was an analysis done by Brian Fallon of the uh, Krupp study and his own study showing that Patients who got antibiotics actually did better in terms of fatigue severity than um, the control patients who weren't treated. Um, so you can kind of get this type of data, but it's really not very convincing because of the num because the numbers are small and the treatment like this small it is short. And then you get the idea, say, chiming in and saying long-term antibiotic therapy may be dangerous, leading to potentially fatal infections in the bloodstream. As a result of intravenous treatment, this is really the theme of the article that just came out. Um, they were saying it back in 2007. Um, but if you look at treatments that are sanctioned by the IDSA, there are a number of diseases where long-term therapy is considered completely appropriate. And those are listed on this slide, where you see that the duration of therapy is anywhere from six months to 5.7 years. So. Um, you know, for certain diseases that are bad enough, long-term therapy is perfectly safe and perfectly adequate, according to the same people who are condemning Lyme treatment. So what about Lyme treatment? I mean, how dangerous is it? So this is the study that Lorraine was referring to from a few years ago uh, of 200 patients with neurologic Lyme disease who got intravenous antibiotic therapy. The average treatment length was four months. And the number of days with an intravascular device to get the IV therapy was 23,654 days. So that's a lot of days with IV therapy. And the number of patients who had side effects, allergic reactions in 3.5%, uh, gallbladder problems in 1%, overall side effects 7.5%. None of the complications were fatal. And then if you compare that to the other studies that were done, the other randomized controlled trials, the actual number of complications per 1,000 IV days, which is how this is usually measured, was about the same as all the other studies that had significantly less time on IV therapy. So IV therapy, according to this study, looks pretty safe in these patients. 
What about efficacy? Well, we did a second study where we ran to, where we uh, compared patients according to how long they had been on treatment, anywhere from one to four weeks to 25 to 52 weeks. And what we found was that the patients who were on for 25 to 52 weeks, so that's six months to a year, had the best outcome in terms of their neurologic symptoms with, with neurologic Lyme disease and with this IV treatment. So what this says is that it may take six to 12 months to get patients better if they have chronic Lyme disease with neurologic symptoms. And this is, of course, far longer than anything that the IDSA has looked at. Um, it's something that we have to look at and hopefully we will eventually. So I want to say a couple of things about co-infections. Uh, there are a number of co-infections that have been identified in ticks, uh, shown on this slide. Um, co-infections have been shown to exacerbate Lyme disease symptoms, so they make the Lyme disease worse. And next slide shows the same thing uh, with babesiosis, ehrlichia. And then it's, there is a perception that these co-infections are acute infections that kind of get there and then go away. But in fact, there's now a lot of literature showing that these co-infections can be chronic and persistent and cause persistent problems with, with Lyme patients. So it's important to pay attention to them. And then in terms of how do you get these co-infections? Well, this is a study from New Jersey from a few years ago where they found that 33.6% of their ticks there were infected with Borrelia burgdorferi, but 34% of the ticks had Bartonella. So your risk of getting Bartonella was probably greater than your risk of getting, getting Lyme disease. And so you have to, again, pay attention to the co-infection. Now this is rickettsia, the map of rickettsia from a study that was done by the CDC a year ago. Uh, and, and if you look at the, uh, the places where people get rickettsia, it's not just the Northeast and the Upper Midwest, it's all over the map. It's all over the South, it's all over the Southwest. We see patients from Mexico who have rickettsia, very common there. So again, you have to pay attention to these co-infections. They're very, very important in Lyme disease. So in conclusion, Lyme disease and co-infections are spreading. Borrelia burgdorferi is difficult to eradicate. Lyme testing is not as sensitive as we're told. Lyme treatment failure is more common than we think. And prolonged antibiotic therapy appears to be useful and appropriate in persistent Lyme disease. And for more information, oh, the candle doesn't flicker in yours. Yeah, well. Wow. <laughs> and go to ILADS or LDO. You can't have everything you want. <laughs> and that's my talk. <laughs> and, and sorry if I went too fast, but I was practicing for 15 minutes.